Hello and welcome to the video lecture for common clinical procedures, part of the clinical sessions course for VODA. So basically common clinical procedures are ones that occur on a daily basis in the vet hospital. So uh, if you had been able to do a um, job shadow and spend a day in a vet clinic, these are all things you likely would have seen. So these things include a physical exam, uh, so basically every patient that comes into the hospital requires an exam. Uh, nail trims, anal gland expressions, radiographs, which are x-rays. Uh, blood work is done on a daily basis, urinalysis. We perform permanent identification, such as microchips and tattoos. Those are usually in conjunction with spay and neuters, which we'll talk about um, in, uh, to in tomorrow's class. And uh, IV catheter placements um, slash IV fluids. So those are all procedures that are pretty common and that's what this little kind of mini lecture is gonna talk about. So first up is physical exam. So like I said already, every pet that visits the hospital is gonna have a physical exam. If they're sick and they come in to, um, you know, for treatment, then the doctor's gonna have to examine them to determine what's wrong. If they come in for surgery, we're gonna do a pre-surgical exam to make sure that they're fit to go under anesthetic. Um, if we have well, basically, that's that's reasons people pets come in, right? So basically, every time an animal is in, they're going to need a physical exam. So the doctor does the physical exams for the most part, um, and they're going to do uh, perform the physical exam by using visual observation, so looking at the pet, auscultation, which means listening, and then palpation, which means feeling. So those are kind of the three skills that you use in a physical exam. So typically the doctor will do physical exams for all the pets that come into the hospital for appointments. Pre-surgical exams are usually done by the RVT. So first up, visual observation. So the doctor is going to look at the eyes, the ears, the mouth, and the skin. So to look at the eyes, the doctor uses an ophthalmoscope. Um, so that's a special little device that uh, can illuminate the eyes. Um, they can look at the outside of the eye, um, so like all the outer surface uh, parts of the eye, and we can also look deep into the eye to look at the retina. The doctor uses an otoscope to examine the ears. Uh, so um, they can look deep inside the ear canal to see the eardrum, make sure that's intact, uh, and as well um, look for any kind of inflammation or infection or signs of infection in the inside of the ear canal. Uh, the mouth, the doctor's just going to open the mouth and look at all the teeth inside, look at the condition of the soft tissues, um, make sure there's nothing like lodged at the back of the mouth. And then the skin, usually they're going to evaluate the hair coat, they're going to kind of brush back some of the hair, look at the skin underneath, make sure there's no, you know, flakies or uh, like red skin uh, indicating some kind of problem underneath, uh, underneath the fur. So those are all things that we can look at visually. So uh, those are the instruments that I mentioned, the ophthalmoscope and the otoscope. So uh, you'll see that the otoscope has these little cones. Those are used to look inside the ear. Um, it kind of helps to focus. So the otoscope creates a light and the cone helps to focus that light inside and deep into the ear canal. There's also like kind of a little magnifying glass um, like back here uh, that you can look into the ear with. And usually you can flip that magnifying glass out of the way and you could put like a cotton tipped applicator down there to get um, like a, a sample if you suspect an ear infection. So our, uh, our next skill that the doctor is going to use is auscultation. So uh, when you're auscultating, you're listening and typically you're going to do that listening with a stethoscope and you're going to use that stethoscope to listen to the heart and the lungs. The doctor can also use the stethoscope to listen to um, gut sounds. Uh, so if we have um, suspicion of like a gut stasis, which means that things are not moving through the intestines the way they should, uh, we, we won't, there'll be an absence of gut sounds. So that's something the doctor could listen for as well. Uh, for the heart, the doctor's listening to make sure it's beating. Uh, they're listening to see if the beats are in a regular rhythm or if they are arrhythmic, which means that they are not in a regular rhythm. Uh, they're also listening to see if the heart sounds are normal. So you can hear heart murmurs if the valves aren't functioning properly. 
Then the doctor will listen to the animal breathing. Uh, so they'll listen to the lungs and see if there's any strange sounds in there. If there's fluid in the lungs or um, any kind of abnormalities in there, you can often hear it on auscultation. And then um, palpation. So the doctor's gonna basically give that dog or cat or whatever animal's in, they're gonna give them a good feel all over. So they're gonna feel all over the body, give them a good pet from head to toe, feeling for any kind of lumps or bumps. They're going to also do, um, they're gonna palpate the abdomen, which is kind of like um, a massage of the belly. They're gonna be feeling for um, the internal organs. You can see, um, like you can feel sometimes if like maybe one kidney is smaller than the other, or um, you can feel if there's like really large stools in the large intestine indicating maybe the animal is it's constipated. Um, you can also feel masses. So if there's like some kind of cancer or something happening in the belly, you might be able to feel that as well. Um, and then the doctor will also assess joints by bending them and feeling if they can feel any kind of um, like crunching in the joint might indicate that there's arthritis. You can also um, palpate things like a drawer sign. So a drawer sign is um, one of the things that we can see if an animal has an ACL rupture or anterior cruciate ligament that's inside the knee. So usually the knee will just bend back and forth, but if they have um, a ruptured ligament that holds that knee stable, you can actually push the knee forward and back as well. Uh, so that's something that the doctor can feel and assess that way. So uh, physical exam um, is definitely one of the things that you would have seen had you been in clinic. Um, also, most likely you would have seen a nail trim as well. So lots of clients just plain are not able or are unwilling to, tr to trim their pet's nails. So maybe the animal's a maniac and uh, injures them if they're trying to do their nails. I know that's really common with cats where people just can't handle the cat um, in a safe way to trim their nails. Um, also, lots of people are just kind of freaked out about the process of trimming animals' nails. Um, it's not something that uh, you need to be freaked out about. If you are properly trained in how to do it, you'll be able to do it well. Um, so, nail trim appointments typically are going to be scheduled with the RVTs. Uh, so, um, you know, the animal comes in for a nail trim alone, they're just going to be booked with a tech. The techs do the uh, nail trim and then send the animal home. Uh, nail trims could also be part of a treatment plan for a pet that's come in for an exam and lots and lots of pets come in for like their vaccines and be like, hey, since they're here, can we do a nail trim too? So uh, we do quite a lot of nail trims, like on a slow day, I would say I do at least 10. So there's tons of nail trims in the vet clinic. So there are a few different tools we can use to trim nails. So we have a plier style clipper, that's this guy here. Those ones you're gonna use more for like large dogs, like that's a fairly substantial one. So I would use that with like a lab or a shepherd, that kind of thing. Um, that's my favorite style of clipper, is that plier style. Uh, I absolutely do not like that guillotine style clipper. So guillotine style clippers have to be held correctly to avoid cutting the quick. If you hold them the wrong way, then it um, advances the clippers forward more and you will make that animal bleed. So we need to be careful using those. So if you're asking me now, well, how do you hold them? You would hold them in this way. So this is the top right here and this is the bottom. So if I'm holding it in here in my right hand, I would be holding it like this. If I have it the other way, so if I had this on top, when I go to press this down, it pushes this part forward on the nail and you will advance it a good like five millimeters maybe, which is a ton when you're talking about quicks. So I personally do not like guillotine style clippers. I feel like I don't have as much control and I feel like um, for clients, they're a lot more likely to injure their animals with those. So I prefer a plier style. Also, I feel like people are pretty familiar with using this type of tool, right? We use tools that look like that often, like your can opener looks like that. Um, if you have pliers, they look like that, right? So, or the style where it's scissors, you've used scissors before. No one's used a tool that looks like this unless they have a guillotine style clipper. So I always ask people, do you wanna learn a new tool and a new skill? Or do you wanna use a tool you're already familiar with and only have to learn the new skill? More often than not, they're gonna opt for this or this style. 
So the scissor style clipper is gonna be used for cats. I also honestly really love the scissor style for small dogs as well. So I'll use these big guys for big dogs. I have a medium one like this that I'll use for like kind of smaller dogs, you know, like your beagle style dogs. And if I have something small like a Chihuahua or a Yorkie or even, even like a pug, I'll probably use these scissor style clippers. So how do we cut nails, you might be asking. So uh, I do have video for you. I have videos included in our classroom here for all of these procedures. They'll give you a lot more details on, um, on the procedures that are mentioned here. Uh, but just as a quick overview, when we're cutting dog nails or cat nails, we need to be concerned about the quick. The quick is this little part right in here that's inside the nail. That quick contains blood vessels and nerves. So guess what? If you cut it, it's gonna bleed and it's gonna hurt. People are terrified of this. They think that their animals are gonna bleed out from a nail trim. I always promise clients while I'm teaching them nail trimming, you will not make your animal bleed to death unless they have an undiagnosed bleeding disorder or something, which is really rare. But uh, real talk, even if you did absolutely nothing, that blood would clot up in about five minutes and stop bleeding. Um, if we do end up cutting, actually I think, hold on, that's my next slide, yeah. Uh, if we do end up cutting their, uh, into the quick, there are things that we can do and I'll talk about it on the next slide. So what we wanna do when we're cutting nails is just cut off a little bit at a time, okay? So um, we just I just kinda of cut off the tips and I just keep cutting until I can see the start of the quick. So I'm sure a lot of you right now are thinking, yeah, sure, easy enough if you have white nails, right? So clear nails, you can see the quick. Um, you can see that pink part of the nail. But if you have a dog with black nails, you can't see the quick through that pigmented nail. So what you need to do is you need to look at the nail head on. So if this is the nail on the side, when I say head on, I mean you're looking at it right here. So right at the tip of that nail. And you look inside that nail and when you cut off and you're nowhere near the quick, it's just gonna look white. And then it's gonna have a black outline. When you start getting close to the quick, you're gonna see a little black dot. Once you see that black dot, just stop, you're done. That's as far as you need to go. Now, if you're a technologist like me and you've got like <laughs> 10 a day for the last 14 years um, or more <laughs> per day, uh, you're really good at cutting nails. Not to brag, but I'm pretty excellent at this. So what I do is I see that little black dot and I just keep on going. I pair around that nail until that black dot starts to look kind of fleshy. When it starts to look fleshy, I know that I'm just like a millimeter away from that uh, quick and that's where I stop. So there's a reason that tech nail trims cost like 20 plus dollars. It's because we're amazing at it. Um, if you just go to like a dog groomer or, you know, those pet stores where they offer a quick nail trim and it's like 10 bucks, they're going to stop at that little black dot. Um, but we take it right down to as low as it can go. So uh, I think our nail trims are certainly worth it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, some people do complain about the cost. Uh, so, like I said, if you do end up cutting the nail too short and making it bleed, there are things you can do. In the vet hospital, we're going to use either silver nitrate applicators. They look like a little stick with like a, you know, you can see the little white dots on the end. Uh, you just press that to the nail um, to like where it's bleeding and it stops the bleeding. It cauterizes it. Uh, I think it's a little bit painful. Dogs do sometimes react, um, but it's not like so painful that it requires anesthesia or anything. There's also the option of quick stop powder, which is a styptic powder. I'm pretty sure you can get this stuff in pet stores. Uh, it also comes in the form of like a little stick. Uh, maybe you've used them, used uh, styptic powder or sticks yourself because they do sell it for humans for like if you nick yourself shaving. So that um, that's something that some people might already even have in their homes. So either of those things can be used to cauterize a bleeding nail. Silver nitrate, I'll give you a fair warning right now, will stain your skin. It'll also stain tables. So it might be a good idea to have like a blanket or a towel on the table if you have countertops and not stainless steel because the silver nitrate will stain the countertops. Uh, and it will stain your skin as well. Um, it kind of stain, it makes it look like, um, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. Um, it's, it just like discolors your skin. So like I have, I have pretty, I'm pretty pale. I have pretty white skin. And when I get silver nitrate on me, it looks like kind of, um, like a little black mole almost, but not raised. Right. So it just kind of stains it like a, like a dark brown color. 
Uh, it's for that reason that like the week, no, not the week, like the month before my wedding, I didn't do any nail trims. I just held for nail trims and had other people do them because I didn't want to get any silver nitrate stuff on my hand for when you do that like hand picture with your rings. And then we never even did that photo. So I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> um, and then another option to do with nail trimming is a Dremel or a grinder. So some clinics will grind nails to get them shorter and smoother. Uh, some groomers will do that as well. Uh, it kind of depends on the clinic if they have that, um, that device available. Uh, but it is nice if you do have a Dremel to, uh, to smooth out the nails for the clients because uh, freshly cut nails can be fairly sharp, but freshly Dremeled nails are not sharp at all. So another procedure you would have seen had you been able to uh, duck into a clinic for a day is likely anal gland expression. So I have a real nice picture of a butt here for you. Uh, so this is the anus. Anal glands are located at about, uh, if this was a clock, four and eight o'clock on the bum. Okay, so um, these anal glands are usually emptied during a bowel movement. So when an animal has a normal stool passed through the anus, it expresses those anal glands on top of the bowel movement, uh, and then everything's fine and dandy. Unfortunately though, some pets' anal glands do not empty naturally, uh, and so we have to express them in the clinic. They might not em empty naturally for a few different reasons. Um, if the animal is constipated and are not pooping, that means that it's not gonna empty. So often constipated pets have anal gland issues as well. Same with pets with diarrhea. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Diarrhea is not a <coughs> Sorry, I'm just choking on my spit here. Diarrhea is not a formed stool, so it doesn't express the anal glands when it passes through. So often animals with diarrhea have full anal glands as well. Sometimes there's an issue with the anal gland itself and how it makes the material. So usually the material that fills up the anal sacs and then needs to be emptied is um, kind of a liquidy, oily um, consistency. So it's like fairly thin, uh, but sometimes it can get really thickened. Uh, so we'll see where it kind of looks like chocolate pudding. Um, I've also seen where it comes out like toothpaste. So it's really thick. Uh, so um, I've also seen, sorry, uh, gritty material as well. So sometimes the grit that's in the material can cause blockages in the little ducts. Also, sometimes there's just um, an anatomy issue. Uh, those animals are the ones that need to come in like every six weeks to have their anal sacs emptied. Um, so anyway, there's lots of reasons why anal glands might be, might be need to, might need to be expressed. So what does expression look like? It looks like this. Uh, so internal expression is what veterinarians and vet techs are do, are doing. Um, only veterinarians and vet techs are permitted to express anal glands internally. Um, vet uh, sorry, like VOAs or, v or VODAs or like groomers, um, they could do external expression, but they're not permitted to do internal. That's considered practicing vet medicine. Um, there are a lot of benefits to doing internal expression. For one, it's not as painful for the animal and external expression is fairly painful. External expression also is not going to fully empty the anal sacs, whereas an internal expression will. So how do we internally express? Put on gloves is the very first step because otherwise you, you're putting an ungloved finger into a dog's bum or a cat's bum. That's just gross. Um, if I haven't mentioned already, also anal gland material smells awful um, and it kind of like seems to stick around and linger. So your hands would literally smell like anal glands all the time if you had no gloves on. So wear a glove because it's gross otherwise. Also, it's going to protect the animal, right? Like fingernails can be sharp. You don't want, I don't know. Anyway, you don't want to be putting an ungloved hand into a dog's bum. So uh, wear a glove and also coat the finger that you're going to insert, uh, coat it with lube. Um, so you need to have some kind of lube on hand in clinic to be able to do procedures like this because an unlubed finger going into the dog's bum is, is just rude. So um, it's inserted into the anus, the finger, and then the, the, you find the anal sac, you locate it, and then you just kind of massage it until it's emptied. So it's, I, I kind of, I call it milking it. So what I do is like, I put the, like if this is my hand in here, I'm using this finger, the thumb, to like stabilize that anal gland. And I'm using this one to go on this side of it, and I just kind of squish it flat. 
and I'm squeezing all the material out. And these little ducts will be about here. So I grab a tissue. Usually I have a tissue in my hand while I'm doing this. So I'm expressing that material directly into a tissue. Once I can't get anything else out, I can feel that they're empty and I can stop. And then I flip over to the other side and I do the other side too. So I have a couple pictures here to share with you. So number one picture there is scooting. Um, <laughs> I, had a, I had a class one time where they didn't know what scooting was. So um, we, we looked up a video on YouTube and it was a compilation of dogs scooting. And oh my God, we just laughed and laughed for like five minutes. So if you need a good laugh, um, you know, Google that. But scooting is a sign that the anal glands are bothering the animal. It indicates that they are full and probably require expressing. What the dog's trying to do is express them themselves. Um, if they have an anatomy issue or, you know, like thickened material, any of those things I talked about before, that dragging their bum isn't going to express them. If it's an animal with no issue um, and they're just kind of bothering them and they do some scooting, it may express them in a normal um, animal. But if they're having issues that, uh, that require manual expression, scooting's not gonna do anything besides maybe make you laugh or, or gross you out because they're dragging their butt in your carpet. That middle picture, that's thickened anal gland material. So that, remember when I said about like, it's kind of like toothpaste? This is like that thick, like toothpaste material. Uh, so the normal material is really liquidy and oily. This is really thickened. Uh, and then I do have a note under there, all anal gland material is smelly. It, it smells pretty awful. I kind of made a joke in like the video, um, the caption for the video about anal gland expression. I said for the full experience, mix like a can of tuna with some feces and let the smell permeate your room. That's about what it smells like. It kind of has a fishy, metallic, poopy smell. It's pretty gross and it lingers. Get some air freshener for the vet clinic if you don't have already. And then to the far right here, I have a picture of an abscessed anal gland. So if those anal glands are left um, and not expressed, they will continue to fill and they will continue to get more and more uncomfortable. Eventually they will abscess, which means there's an infection in there. And eventually that abscess will rupture. So um, it will open up. They'll have a wound next to the bum, just like you can see here. And, um, and they'll be like oozing that smelly anal gland infection pus material. Ideally, we wanna see animals before it gets to the abscess and rupture point. So um, another um, another procedure you would have seen had you been in the vet clinic is radiographs. So radiographs are x-rays and they're a really awesome way to visualize the inside of an animal. So this picture here, um, I call it, uh, well, I, I didn't coin this term, but uh, often it's called the catagram. It's just the picture of the entire cat. Uh, so x-rays are typically going to be taken by vet techs. Um, possibly with another vet tech or a VOA or VODA to, um, to assist with restraint. And then the veterinarian is the one that evaluates the, uh, the x-rays. So whenever we're taking x-rays, we need to have our personal protective equipment on. So um, I love this guy's whole, whole vibe. He's, he's amazing because he is decked out with his gear. So he has on his lead goggles. Lots of clinics skip the goggles. Um, I think that's ridiculous because I do not want to develop um, like cataracts because I was taking x-rays and b believe it or not, closing your eyes is not protecting you against x-rays. Yes, I have heard people say that. No, it is not protective. Um, so you need to have those goggles. Um, and you can't really see, but he has a thyroid shield underneath his apron. He also has that apron on and he is wearing his gloves. Look at that. So sometimes in vet clinics, people get lazy and they just set those gloves on top of their hands. That's not protecting you from anything. Uh, so you need to be actually wearing those lead gloves. You can see he's also holding a positioner. He has sandbags here and he has a V trough. That V trough is um, radio, uh, hold on. I always I have always have such a hard time thinking of what the opposite is. Radiopaque means that it shows up in x-ray. Radiolucent means that it does not. So it's radiolucent. It does not show up in the x-ray. Uh, so hands-free uh, x-ray is an option and lots of clinics are starting to get on board with hands-free x-ray. Um, if they're not on board with those just yet, you're going to have at least two people in the room to take the x-ray. 
all the people in the room need to be gowned up and have all the gear on. And everyone in the room taking x-rays needs to have a dosimeter as well. So the dosimeter is what measures your exposure to um, radiation. Um, oh, I sorry. Hands-free x-ray, by the way, means that you can take the x-ray without anyone in the room. So there's lots of cool tricks that you can use to make the animal think that it's being restrained. And it just lays there nicely. You take the picture and then you come back in and let them up. So hands-free is really cool because it significantly reduces your exposure to radiation. So I have a couple pictures here for you. I have film x-rays. So some clinics might still have film x-ray. I think most are moving to digital at this point. So if you still have a facility that has a film x-ray, you're going to have little film inside cassettes. You're gonna lay the animal on top of the cassette, take the x-ray and then develop the film. It's like a 10 minute process. If you have an automated um, developer, it might be a little bit quicker, uh, but it's fairly involved to develop those x-rays. Uh, digital x-ray is like 10 seconds. It's so amazing and so fast. It's better quality x-rays and you can see it right up on the computer screen and share them with the client that way. They can be emailed to specialists. Digital x-ray is the way to go. And then x-ray uh, positioners, um, we've kind of talked about those already. So they don't show up in x-ray and they can help you keep animals in the correct position. So I shared with you here a couple uh, just interesting x-rays. So this one is a foreign body ingestion. Any guesses what this dog ate? Yeah, that's a spoon. <laughs> dog swallowed a spoon and now it's in the belly. So you can see it hanging out there. That's probably going to need surgery to come out. Um, this is an x-ray of a dog with bladder stones. So the bladder is right here and you can see, you can see all the individual stones. There's like a huge one, some other big ones and lots of little pebbly ones down here. So, uh, stones in the bladder show up on x-ray really well. Um, and one thing that's kind of cool about them is that, uh, we often discover bladder stones incidentally. So maybe the animal's in because um, like they're coughing or they're vomiting or something. So we take an x-ray and we can see the, the stones in the bladder. We weren't trying to take a picture of the bladder. We weren't suspecting anything wrong with the bladder. Uh, but now that we found them, we can deal with them and address them before they become, become a problem. Uh, any guesses what this dog ate? Just kidding, it's a pregnant dog. <laughs> so can you see the little puppies in there? So cute, right? So what we can do, often um, people want to take um, x-rays of their dogs when they are in late stages of pregnancy uh, or cats so that they know how many puppies to expect. Um, so we do usually do that in like the third trimester of the dog's pregnancy and then we count the babies. So you have an option when you're counting babies, you can either count spines or you can count skulls, but you shouldn't count both because you'll end up uh, estimating more puppies. So I'll give you a minute here, see if you can count either spines or skulls and guess how many puppies are in there. So I see uh, five puppies. So one spine here, two spine, three spine, four spine, five spine. I personally prefer to count spines. I think they're clearer than skulls. Skulls, it's like one, two, three, for, I feel like the fifth one is muddled up in there somewhere. So uh, I prefer personally to count the spines. Uh, so anyway, I figured I'd share a couple of cool x-rays with you. They're not always that interesting, but uh, those ones, I always like seeing pregnant ones and, you know, interesting foreign bodies. All right, so blood work is another um, procedure that's fairly common in the vet hospital. So bl blood work gives us tons of information about the health of the animal. So um, basically blood tests are gonna be one of the first steps in terms of diagnostics anytime an animal comes in and is sick. Uh, so we also do a lot of blood work that's kind of like screening as well. So um, like in Manitoba here, heartworm season is a really big deal. We uh, do blood tests on Basically, every dog that's a client will be doing a blood test on at some point between April, May, June. So um, so that's a super busy time here. I know it's not uh, as much, um, well, an issue at all in Calgary, um, but definitely here in, uh, in Manitoba, that's a really busy season for blood work. 
But it, like I said, anytime sick animals are in, we're probably gonna do blood work on them. And uh, animals that are in for surgery, usually uh, we're always gonna recommend pre-anesthetic blood work. And I would say for the most part, I, th I find most clients do go for it. So the vet techs collect the blood sample, usually in conjunction with a VOA or VODA. And um, usually the vet techs are operating the lab machines as well, but that is something that VOAs and VODAs can do. I will happily train um, my, my VOAs in clinic. I'll happily train them on how to use the lab machines because they're pretty easy and straightforward to do. And um, you can really free me up a lot of time uh, to do the things that I absolutely have to do, like pull the blood, um, if you're able to do things like run the lab machines. So if that's something you're interested in doing, certainly ask about it in the hospital. So most most hospitals, unless they're like uh, maybe like a mobile practice, they might not have in-house blood machines, but any uh, you know brick and mortar hospital is gonna have in-house analyzers. Usually, depending on the brand, so the ones I pictured here are IDEX. Those are the ones that I'm most familiar with. I've used IDEX the most and I think they're the most user friendly and they're just so integrative. I really like um, the IDEX suite in general, uh, but I've also used like a Baxis is another one that's really good, but I just like IDEX better. So I picked them to show you pictures of, uh, but the IDEX suite here can get you blood results in 20 minutes or less, depending on what, uh, what tests you're running. So uh, it's really handy to have those available. Uh, when we collect blood, we're going to collect it in blood tubes. You can see here, there's like a whole rainbow of colors. Uh, different colors are for different purposes. I'm not going to get in deep into it here because we talk way more about it in your vet assisting course. Uh, and then in the middle picture here, we got a little chihuahua getting a lot of blood pulled and it's being pulled from the jugular vein. So jugular venipuncture is a really great option for collecting blood because you can get a lot of volume. It's pretty easy to do. And um, it is like not very traumatic for the animal. So uh, jugular vein is my preferred vein for sure for blood collection. You do have other options for veins as well. There's one in the front leg. There's one on the inside of the hind leg for cats and the outside of the hind leg for dogs. Uh, but we'll talk more about that in vet assisting and like restraint. And then this last picture here on the right, uh, that's a picture that the, of the laser sight results. So the laser sight is the IDEX machine that, um, actually, sorry, this is the pro sight. I put laser sight, but it's actually pro sight. Um, I mean, it doesn't really matter. They basically do the same thing, but the, the pro sight gives you these fancy dot graphs. But anyways, this is what um, an example of blood work looks like. So this is a CBC, a complete blood count. You can see it's really straightforward. There's the low column, the normal column, and the high column. Low column is blue, high column is red. So right away, you can see the little flags of things that might be abnormal and of concern. So it makes it really easy to go over blood work with clients because it's so visual, right? It's a really nice way of presenting the information. Some of the other blood machines just print out a, like long lists of numbers. And I find that that blood work is more difficult to go over with clients. This is so visual. I think even if you know nothing about anything, you can see, oh yeah, there's four things that are high. Uh-oh, right? So um, I think it's pretty straightforward for clients. Uh, now that being said, you uh, as a VODA or a VOA will not be going over blood results with clients. That's a doctor's job to do. So the doctor is the one that's going to present that information to the clients. Uh, another lab test that's run fairly frequently in vet clinics is urinalysis. Uh, bladder issues are fairly common. We, we saw the x-ray with stones, right? We see blocked cats all the time and we see so many bladder infections. So we are going to check for that with a urinalysis. So I'm not getting huge into urinalysis here, uh, but I did wanna talk about the different ways that we can collect urine. So we have basically three options. The first one on the left there is free catch. You can see a person holding a bowl underneath the dog as it pees. That's it. It's really easy to do. Clients can do it. Uh, techs can do it. VOAs or VOTAs can do it. Uh, the middle one is a urinary catheter. We're only going to do that for male dogs. So basically we expose the penis. We uh, feed in a catheter into, um, into the urethral opening and we feed it back until it gets into the bladder and then we're able to remove urine. 
so that one is only really able to be done in a male dog. I know sometimes, some, I don't know, I've worked with one doctor that often wants to try to do it with females, but it's really difficult to do with females. Uh, the, the method of collection of choice for a female um, dog or cats in general is going to be the cystocentesis because it's going to be the most sterile sample. It is collected directly from the bladder with a needle and a syringe. Um, you can do it without an ultrasound. This picture is an ultrasound guided one. So this is the ultrasound probe. They're looking at the picture to find the bladder. They're poking the bladder with the needle and you can see the needle go in on the ultrasound. Uh, so another task or procedure that you would see frequently in the clinic, most often attached with spay and neuters is permanent identification. So we do permanent ID in the form of tattoos and microchips. There are a lot of pros and cons to each. We've gone over pros and cons um, already a bunch of times. Uh, so you know that, um, that there are good things and bad things to each. Uh, I like to recommend just getting both done. I think that's the most ideal choice. Tattoos are typically done for free, so all you have to do is pay for the microchip. So first off, our first thing is ear tattoos. Ear tattoos are gonna be placed in the right ear and they are placed at the time of spay or neuter. You do not get an ear tattoo if you have not been spayed or neutered. So uh, these are a series of letters and numbers and it's kind of like a code that you can use to determine when the tattoo was placed, what vet clinic placed it, and what number the animal is. So the numbers usually just go up chronologically. The first animal to be spayed or neutered is number one. The 4,000th animal to be spayed or neutered is number 4,000, okay? So they just you just use the next number that's available. So the first letter in a tattoo is going to indicate what year the tattoo is done. Uh, I have included for you guys in the classroom the Cal or sorry the Alberta master list of uh, the tattoo letters. So it includes um, a big old list of all of the clinics in your province and um, and the letter that's associated with them. You'll notice that sometimes there are two uh, clinics for one letter. Um, uh, my understanding just from looking at the phone numbers and the area codes is that they're doing that because some are in Calgary and some are in Edmonton, right? So it's pretty likely if you find the cat in Calgary that it wasn't the Edmonton clinic. Start with the Calgary clinic. It's probably that one. Uh, so when you look for an ear tattoo, you're going to check in the right ear. You're going to try to find that tattoo and you're going to try to read it. So this tattoo you can see in this cat is very prominent. It's big, it's in the middle of the ear, it's really blocky letters and numbers. That's what we want to see, a nice dark tattoo. Um, more often than not though, uh, <laughs> I honestly don't know why, techs try to place them really low in the ear and they make them really small so that uh, it's not visible just like when you're looking at the cat. You have to look deep in the ear to find them. The problem with that though is you can't read them. So tattoos in general fade with time. When they're deep in an ear like that, it's almost impossible to read them. So it doesn't really give a lot of information then if you can't read the number, right? Uh, so when you have a stray cat come in or a stray dog, you're gonna find that tattoo number in the right ear. Write down the number. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell what the number is. So I would guess at possibilities or the letters or whatever. And then what you do is you call the clinic that um, placed that tattoo and you say uh, you have a lost animal there with an ear tattoo and you'd like them to trace the number. So they're going to look back in their records at the year that you've indicated based on the letter and, uh, and the number and try to see if it's a match. So if you have a dog, well this is a cat and it's, it looks like the number 111. Um, so if you call the clinic that's I don't know, TS, I think that looks like. If you call the TS clinic and say, hey, I've got this number to look up, and they look up 111, and it's like a beagle, they're gonna be like, yeah, yeah, no, that's a dog. And you'd be like, hmm, okay. It could also be 777. And then they look up 77, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, it's like a tabby cat with white. And you're like, yep, that's the one. So sometimes it's a little bit of a guessing game too. So ear tattoos are hardly the most ideal form of permanent ID. 
Uh, so this is a tattoo machine. Yeah, it's exactly the same as the kind of tattoo machines you would get a tattoo at a tattoo parlor. Um, in fact, I source my ink and my needles and my tattoo parts from the local tattoo shop down the street. <laughs> uh, and then I have a picture here kind of of the tattoo process. Um, so tattoos are only gonna be done when the patient is under anesthetic. They're only gonna be done during a spay or neuter surgery. That needle is dipped into black ink and then you, you kind of mark the number into the, the number in the letter into the ear. Uh, and I think I've said it a bunch of times already, but it is the right ear that that tattoo is going in. So we've established that um, tattoos are fine. They're fine, but they're not amazing. Microchips, that's where it gets amazing. So microchips are a tiny little device. So like this is an actual size picture. If we had a piece of rice here, it would be the same size. So microchips are the size of a grain of rice and they are implanted under the skin between the shoulder blades. Uh, when that microchip is scanned by a microchip scanner, it produces a number and you can call the microchip company and say, hey, I have this number. And they say, okay, great, that is this person and gives you the contact information. Uh, so microchips can be used in any animal. Um, typically, you're not gonna be tattooing the ear of your turtle because they don't have well, a turtle is a bad example. I don't know how you'd place a microchip in a turtle. Um, but like, let's say you have like a bearded dragon or something. You could microchip a bearded dragon. You can't put an ear tattoo in a bearded dragon. So microchips can be used in any animal. They can also be placed in awake animals. They don't need to be under anesthetic. And the beautiful thing about microchips is they are not local to your province only. They can be tracked internationally. One thing that is a little bit of a confusion with clients, sometimes they think that microchips are GPS devices. That is not the case. <laughs> you can, you're not gonna see where your animal is um, like on a GPS map because they have a microchip. The microchip just stores a, a number that's linked with the animal's information. So again, a couple of pictures here. I have the process of scanning. So before we place a microchip, we always wanna scan the entire animal, not just over the shoulder blades. I'll start over the shoulder blades, but I will scan the entire animal. That's because sometimes microchips can migrate to other places in the body. Uh, I've seen microchips um, like down here, like in the chest area. So they've kind of moved underneath there. I've seen them in the armpits. Um, I don't know how much I believe this, but one of the shelters that we will visit um, in Winnipeg with the class, they uh, she says she's found a microchip in a cat's tail. I don't know if I believe her though. Um, this is like the microchip implanter. So there's a few different types. This one looks like kind of a syringe dart thing. Um, they also come in like kind of a gun format. Uh, basically the microchip is preloaded inside that needle. When you take the cap off and you depress the plunger, um, after the needle is in the skin, it pushes the microchip out into the place under the skin, the subcutaneous area there. And then this is a microchip reader. Um, it is... Oh, sorry, this is supposed to say microchip scanner, not number, uh, but the scanner reads and reports the microchip number. So you can see the number in here, and then I just need to call the phone number, usually it's just on the back of the machine, and say, hey, this is the number I have, and they can find the owner information for you. So what's the process when you have a lost animal come in? We talked about checking for tattoos. Uh, if the tattoo isn't a, a successful in inquiry, we're gonna, well, I'm gonna look for microchip and tattoo all the time, um, but uh, definitely we'll scan for, ta for a microchip. So you wave that scanner over their entire body. Like I said, it can migrate. So I do the entire body of that animal. Um, and if it beep beeps and give you a number, then great. You can contact the microchip company and get the info. If there's no microchip, then you might just have an animal that is completely unowned uh, if it doesn't have a microchip or tattoo. Uh, so it might just be a true stray, in which case you'll probably refer to the, uh, you know, like a shelter or something. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is our last topic, IV catheter and IV fluids. So I do have a really great video for you um, from at Dove that you can watch. It's all uh, shows you right up close how they place that IV catheter, how they tape it in place, how they bandage it, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's a really great video. I strongly encourage you to watch that one. Um, IV catheters we're gonna use to deliver medication right into a vein or to give fluids right into a vein. So, 
we, I really like to have IV fluids on board with every single surgery. In some animals and some surgeries, it might be optional depending on your clinic's policies. Um, but IV fluids are certainly part of treatment plans for sick pets. So uh, this is kind of just like a little picture of the, um, of the process. So when you're placing an IV catheter, um, the place over the vein, you're gonna shave it and you're gonna do a scrub. So this is them scrubbing it clean. Then you're going to place the catheter in, you get a little flash of blood. At that point, you can advance the catheter right till it's at the skin there and you can pull that needle out. And then you cap the catheter with, um, with uh, like the IV fluids or a cap and tape it all into place and bandage it. Uh, so that's just kind of like a little step-by-step -step picture. The video is way better though. It shows you all live how it happens. Um, so I have a couple pictures here of some of the equipment you would use for IV, catheter, IV catheters and fluids. So IV catheters obviously is one of them. You can see that there's different colors. Those different colors are associated with different sizes. So the yellow one's the smallest. You can see it's really thin and fairly short. This is a bit thicker, still short. This is pretty long and getting a bit, like quite a bit thicker. And then this one is honestly huge. And I would use that in like a Great Dane. Uh, and I would use this in like a Chihuahua. <laughs> uh, I think there might be, oh no, maybe the 24 is the smallest one. I was thinking there might be one smaller that I've used in ferrets, but I think it actually is just the 24 that I've used in ferrets. And then IV fluids, there's a lot of different types and they come in different volumes. Uh, your most common size that you're going to use for IV fluids is probably your liter bags. Um, so they're 1000 mLs of fluid. Most common fluids used is most likely uh, your saline as well, which is just the fluid equivalent to what's in blood. Um, you can get up to, I think, five liter bags. Um, we have special ordered those in. Usually they're for like horses. We've special ordered them in. We had these... Um, uh, Irish wolfhounds that needed IV fluids and they were just going through them at such a fast rate because they're such a huge animal that we needed the bigger uh, the bigger fluid bags for them and then this is an example of an infusion pump uh, this is like a fairly old style but I feel like it's, they're really common in vet clinics this style so that's why I chose this one to to put um, they're like workhorses this this brand they they seem to just last forever so that's why I think they're so common but there are a lot smaller ones available now that are more modern looking too. Uh, so infusion pumps are responsible for making sure that the fluid is flowing into the animal at the correct rate. You can set a fluid rate with uh, just the IV line but it's a little bit more temperamental and can take quite a bit of time sometimes to establish the correct flow rate. Infusion pump, you just put, you feed the IV line through the, the, um, the, I guess, chamber here, and then you just input the number and it does it all for you. So infusion pumps are where it's at. And that is it. That's everything for common procedures here. So um, at this point, I would say head on out and watch all the videos that are uploaded into the classroom. Uh, go through all those. And then uh, I do have a practice activity for you about tattoos. So you can look into those, um, the practice activity, look at the examples uh, of ear tattoos, and then you'll be deciphering them and answering some questions. Uh, and then when you're all finished that, uh, you're done for the day, I think. So go ahead and fill up that exit slip and then have a great day.